My next guest has a rather unique perspective. This is Dr. James Fallon. He's a neuroscientist at the University of California, Irvine. He studies the brains of psychopaths. And I guess in the process, you learn something rather startling about your own brain. Tell me about that. Well, Dr. Drew, you know, about 25 years old, you're supposed to figure out who you are. Well, it, it took me uh, until I was about 60 to really figure out who I was. It was sort of an interesting upside-down world I went through the past couple of years. You found out, I guess, that I'm going to show somebody what, what you discovered. I'm going to show my viewers this, and let's have you interpret. Up here on, this, on the scan, on the screen here, are brain scans of a normal person. So these, these yellow and red areas are nice, hot brain activity. Again, this is normal. And then right. here's Jim, Jim Fallon, Dr. Fallon's brain. You see this blue area out here in what's called the frontal cortex, the orbital frontal system. These are the front part of the brain ain't working so well there. And what did that mean to you? Well, I thought when I saw it, because I had been studying so many uh, killers' brains, I, I thought the, uh, the piles of scans were mixed up. I thought it was one of the killers. And uh, it turned out when we decoded it, it was mine. It was uh, uh, quite unusual because it was about as bad as you can get in terms of having these areas of the brain that are involved in moral decision-making, ethics, and controlling impulses uh, be completely turned off in me. And so, had, had uh, you had difficulty in that sort of functioning and your sort of understanding of morality and appreciating and empathizing with other people? Had that been sort of a, a problem for you? <clears throat> uh, I, I think so. You know, very early on, I was hyper-religious. I was uh, from our diocese in New York. I was Catholic Boy of the Year. I, I, and I, I thought things were sins and immoral uh, that weren't. And uh, as I got older, some switch happened in my late teens, early 20s, where I, I lost that hyper-religiosity to, to a point where I didn't think anything was wrong. And so something happened during my adolescent development, probably. We don't have scans from them. But all of my behavior and all of uh, my symptoms uh, certainly point to that. So somehow okay. during development... That, and what, well, tell us what the criteria are for a psychopathic killer. This is, again, we're not talking about psychotic killer. We're talking about psychopathic killer, right. which is largely a genetically-based disorder. What are those features? Well, there's, there are pos sort of positive uh, symptoms, if you will, and more negative symptoms. The positive ones are the ones that make the, so the psychopaths very sociable. They're, you know, they're glib, they're charming, uh, extremely sociable. They can be life of the party, and they can be disarming in that way. They're very friendly, and, uh, but also they, they lack a certain kind of empathy. They may be empathetic in a very different way, empathetic like Hitler and the, you know, Stalin, and even the Norway shooter uh, had empathy for a tribe, if you will. Uh, but there's a, that lack of empathy and connectedness with people uh, personally, that's a hallmark of these. But this makes, uh, there's these positive symptoms. Then there's these negative sort of parts of the hair, Robert Hare's checklist, uh, that have to do with criminality. Uh, I score very high in the first part and not as much in the second part. But the second part uh, involves a hypersexuality, uh, you know, being really loose uh, morally, uh, but also some criminality, not taking responsibility for your actions. Uh, all those things that uh, make somebody really, and in a way, parasitic. Do you think, now you're talking, using, we're using a lot of big language here, like sort of criminal tendencies and inability to have right. moral judgment. Now, that's different than the gentleman in Colorado. Do you have a theory about what was going on in his brain? Well, of course, we don't know much about him at all. When you look at him and you, you say, well, here's a guy who's, you know, in his mid-20s, and, and all of a sudden he, becomes, he really becomes very quiet and, and, and stranger. Well, this would be typical of somebody who's going through their first psychotic break in schizophrenia. Yes. Because usually schizophrenia starts to occur in your late teens, early 20s, just yes. like him. That's right. And there's something that brings that on, some stressor. But it, there's always a stressor. You know, he, he, he uh, you know, left gra uh, graduate school. Uh, some people, they lose a, a mate, et, et cetera. But there's always something there uh, that precipitates it. So in, in a way, the genes uh, and the brain pattern, you know, load the gun and then the, the environment pulls the trigger. And that's usually a stressor, a real stressor. Let's take a quick, which, quick call before we go to break. Denise in British Columbia. Denise. Hi. Yeah, I just was watching the other day on one of the news coverages. Mm -hmm. And there was this fellow that said he'd gone to university with him. Mm -hmm. And he was really putting him down, like he was a real jerk, and nobody liked him, and nobody talked to him. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if this could have um, been sort of bullying 
and something a few months ago sort of happened and tipped them over the edge. Dr. Fallon, I, I guess that's a possible theory, but I think more it's as people descend into psychosis, they become rather odd and withdraw socially, and kind of people get scared of that, and they, they may be unkind. Right. Would, would you say that's more they'll likely? Walk away, yeah. They'll walk away or attack them in some way or bully them. They're just they're obvious targets. Okay. Uh, but, you know, it's, but they're, that, those stressors are going to be there. It's not like the stressors cause it. Like the bullying caused it. It just precipitates what's probably inevitable. And by the same token, I think I've heard you say that in addition to the genetics of psychopathy, which is, again, the other disorder where people become killers, that's genes also plus an environmental hit like abuse in childhood. And the abuse doesn't have to be extraordinary. That's right. It would have to be pretty severe abuse early on. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you're two, three, five years old, after you're about seven or eight, there's much less of an effect. Uh, so it's that timing of the stressor and the abuse with a certain group of genes that make you susceptible.